Arif Dov Khabrim, I'm Stephen Ben-Noon. You're watching Israeli News Live, March 1st, 2018. Very troubling news uh, all over, all over the news around the world that North Korea is actually assisting Syria with chemical weapons. Now, I can't help but believe from what I am seeing already that this is a false flag staged event. Of course, the evidence has been presented to the United Nations, and there's a lot of evidence presented to the United Nations that is actually to the contrary, that, nor that Syria is not using chemical weapons. In fact, they gave up their stockpile when President Obama was about ready to attack when they were allegedly accused of using chemical weapons on uh, East Gota, the very place that is all inflamed right now, crawling with a bunch of jihadist thugs that want to do nothing but burn and kill and maim the Syrian people. Aaron Erdem, as we brought out to you guys, clearly identified the fact that ISIS had smuggled sarin gas through their borders, the Turkish borders, with the complicity of the Turkish government and was smuggled all the way to East Ghouta, where they actually used that sarin gas attack to kill many Syrian civilians. Uh, kind of looking at this on the New World, Rep New World Order report, UN report, North Korea sent chemical weapons to Syria, says in here, according to the report, two, two North Korean shipments to a Syrian government agency responsible for the country's chemical weapons program were intercepted in the last few months. Says the report, the panel is investigating reported prohibited chemical, ballistic, missile, and conventional arms cooperation between Syria and the DPRK, the expert wrote in a 37-page report. Well, if the shipment was intercepted, then I don't guess Syria has chemical weapons. But then again, this is an alleged report to begin with, uh, or the report can be real, not so much alleged, but the point is, is was it manufactured? There is such a global move with all the NATO allies to take down Syria. They don't care what links they have to go to to get UN resolution allowing them to bomb and kill every Syrian civilian in the entire country. Let's move on. Two members of the state in, uh, inter, uh, interdicted ship, uh, interdicted shipments <clears throat> destined for Syria. Another member state informed the panel that it had reasons to believe that goods were part of a COMED contract with Syria, according to the report. COMED is the Korea Mining Development Trading Corporation and was blacklisted by the Security Council in 2009 and described as Pyongyang's key arms dealer and exporter of equipment related to the ballistic missiles and conventional weapons. In March 2016, the Council also blacklisted the two COMED representatives on Syria. The consigners were Syrian entities designated by the European Union and United States as front companies for Syria's Scientific Studies and Research Center. So all in all, they intercepted the ships according to the claim here, presented evidence that they were smuggling in chemical weapons for the Syrian government. Now, let's take a very serious look again and even more in depth about what's going on and what this is about to ignite, as we've already brought out on Israeli News Live before this whole issue uh, with the Syrian uh, chemical attacks each time being uh, blamed on Bashar al-Assad has been proven time and time again it was never Assad. Today we'll be looking at Seymour Hersh and the evidence that he uncovered back in 2013 that will really indict the true parties that were involved for this chemical attack there. But what's happening as a result of all this? Russia, Russia is getting ready and Russia is sending a clear signal that they're not going to tolerate anything anymore. In fact, they're showing off their, uh, their Super Satan II, as it's dubbed in the United States, nuclear ballistic missile. And the sad thing is, if you notice in that imagery there, Florida happens to be one of the targets. Well, let me just back up to that just for a moment there. And let me point out something here as well. President Putin, don't forget, it was two U.S. generals that actually stopped the United States from launching a nuclear attack on your country already. And here, Florida is being targeted. Very troubling indeed to see these images like this here. But I think the point is, is Russia is trying to send a clear message to the world that they don't want to be 
getting involved in any type of a nuclear war, but they're not going to play around if they do. They are showing the sophistication of their weapons and what their weapons are able to do. <clears throat> and in fact, if you've ever watched the documentary Crimea, The Way Home, you will also notice that in that documentary there, Crimea The Way Home, we'll kind of stop this video here, that President Putin made it clear that he was trying to send a message to the Western allies that they meant business. They didn't want to go to war, but they meant business if they're attacked. And Putin said then he would use nuclear weapons. Well, the news is abuzz with this type of information today. We have the Jerusalem Post here coming out with an article, Putin, Moscow would regard nuclear attack on allies as attack on Russia. That article comes out on the Jerusalem Post, a breaking news this morning. Moscow President Vladimir Putin said on Thursday that Moscow would regard a nuclear attack on its allies as a nuclear attack on Russia itself and would immediately respond. Putin said that Russia had tested an array of new nuclear weapons, including a new nuclear-powered missile at the end of 2017, which could reach almost any point in the world and could not be intercepted by any anti-missile system as we showed the demonstration of that footage moments ago there. Also RT, Putin on new U.S. nuclear stance. If attacked, Russia will use nukes. You know, I don't think that Putin is wanting to see a war in this world, but he's trying to make it clear because in this case, he is the underdog. Russia may be the largest country in the world, but he is faced with enemies of every nation. The UK recently talking about making preparations for war from one government official. The United States, European Union, and many other allies of the NATO partners all posturing for possible war that could involve Russia. US generals telling the Marines in Norway prepare for a pretty, you know, what war coming up. Everything is directed at Russia. And so Russia continues to send a message. They also noted here on RT as well uh, that came out today, U.S. established up to 20 military bases in Syria's Kurdistan, as it's called. Russia's Security Council uh, is saying here, says here that the, uh, the return of peace and stability to Syria is hampered by continued external interference in the Syrian crisis. For example, in the territory controlled by the People's Self-Defense Units of Kurdistan, some 20 U.S. military bases have been created, the official said. U.S. interference in Syria's conflict has provoked Turkey into launching a military operation targeting Kurdish militias in the northern Syrian region of Afrin. The provocation took the form of boosting the Kurds with advanced weaponry, according to uh, Vened, uh, Vened Katov. There is all kinds of of stories that are coming out right now through Russian media outlets there, and all of them seem to be pointed to let the American people know what is going on, things that they've not reported before that are very concerning. It also says here in another article released today, U.S. gave Kurds modern arms made Turkey launch Afrin Op, Russian Security Council stated as well, which is part of what we read in the, uh, the one before that. Then we have this one here. Putin says U.S. has deployed five cruisers, 30 destroyers near Russian borders as part of a missile defense system. That's pretty serious. I mean, if Russia was deploying all these ships around our borders, we would definitely go to war with Russia. And I couldn't blame the United States if they did. It's not to say that Russia doesn't send a spy ship along our coastline. We know that happens, or a spy plane uh, near the borders of the United States, as does the United States with Russia on a regular basis. But to deploy five cruisers and 30 destroyers on a country's border as part of your missile defense system, that's pretty concerning. And I think that what Russia is doing now is allowing their media outlets to bring out all the threats that Russia is facing so that the world can see for themselves that Russia is not just here to be, an, they're not here as an aggressor, but the aggression is coming against them on a daily basis. Now, I put together once again for, for you guys, I wanted you to be able to see, and I think I covered up all of my notes, so let me pull them all out here. I wanted you to be able to see firsthand several key elements here 
that is part of different things that were bought, brought out by Americans, Canadians, uh, different members of NATO that have been to, that have actually been there to Syria and what they reported from their own findings. All right, so we're going to look at some of these here real quick, and let me just kind of make sure that we're up on our volumes and everything so that we got everything just right here. The first one here we're going to start with at the very beginning of the video here. We'll go to one minute and 20 seconds into this video. Now close to it there. This is, uh, this is uh, the, uh, I forget this gentleman's name here, but he kind of opens the remarks. We're going to listen to about a minute of this video. Listen into this. Developments both in Syria and here in the peace movement in the United States. Um, our delegation, Peace Council delegation to Syria, um, started a campaign of information and uh, educational process in, in the United States in different cities. Um, we faced a huge uh, amount of uh, backlash in terms of uh, accusations, but we have overcome that. But because of that uh, backlash, um, a few of us in the peace movement, including uh, U.S. Peace Council, United National Anti-War Coalition, International Action Center, and Vice President of Veterans for Peace, decided that uh, it's time for us to call, pull our forces together and uh, create a front that uh, would confront the misconceptions and lies that are going on about Syria. Uh, I wanted to start that right there. This was the delegation I spoke about the other day where we played part of what uh, Henry Lowendorf said about that that was going on. And I want you to hear from different members a little short sections of what they have to say. The next one I'm going to play is Sarah Flounders. Uh, and she is the uh, CODA director of the International, Sir uh, International Syrian um, culture, I believe, is what her title is there. Let me play an excerpt for you from her as well, from 516 here, and uh, for about 15 seconds, listen to her comments here. Message on the role of the U.S. war and the way in which the United States has instigated um, through many criminal alliances this war on Syria, this effort to completely destroy Syria. And so... Very troubling. Ms. Flounders actually talks about that the United States created the war. Now, this was under President Barack Hussein Obama under his administration, and they call it criminal acts. And many times you'll see that throughout these different uh, comments here. Some will be a little bit more lengthy that I want to play, such as in the case of Dr. Donna Nasser, who is an attorney and a professor uh, at Berkeley University. I want to play a little clip of what she has to say next. We'll go to the nine minute 30 second mark there just to pick up on what she has to say on this listen to what uh, Dr. Nasser has to say about the war in Syria um, I, I uh, again had the honor to be part of that delegation and um, we had the opportunity to meet with not only government officials but NGOs um, students academics religious leaders civil society business people and we did have an opportunity to meet with President Assad for almost two hours during that delegation. Uh, we came away understanding that what's happening in Syria is criminal. Um, I came back here as an American feeling uh, disturbed and ashamed of what my government is doing and continues to do. We are heading a coalition of governments who is, whose intent is to make the Syrian people suffer and remove their duly elected president. Uh, Syria is a sovereign nation. We have no right to do this. And we promised the Syrian people that we met with when we were there that we would come back and speak truth. And that is what the U.S. Um, uh, Peace Council is doing through these talks. Uh, and, you know, clearly, I think at this point, most people understand that it is not the civil war that we are being told uh, in the media. It this is, a is important. War. It's a proxy war. And people who are being paid and supported militarily, financially, to create the discourse and the suffering that we have been seeing in Aleppo and other places. It was clear to us from the meetings that we had that most of the Syrian people support Assad. And in fact, we didn't 
in all of our meetings, we didn't come across anyone who who wasn't in support of Assad. There were people who were maybe critical of some things, but not everyone is unified. And um, regardless of religion, area where you live, regardless of any divisions that we in the United States like to um, uh, like to use labels we like to use to divide people, people in Syria are Syrians first. And they support Assad. They are looking to him to continue to lead the Syrian Arab army, to take back whatever places uh, have been uh, destroyed or stolen from them by foreigners. While he's doing this, he continues to provide free education, medical treatment to Syrian citizens. He is working hard to preserve the infrastructure. And he's also, with his government, maintaining and understanding that reconciliation has to start now. It can't wait until after. And so again, just a little glimpse there with uh, Dr. Uh, Nasser there and uh, her sights and her, in, uh, her things that she saw within this. Now also, <clears throat> uh, Vanessa Bealey is mentioned. She was part of the delegation as well. And she is regarded as uh, uh, by Henry Lo Dr. Henry Lowendorf as a remarkable journalist. I believe that Vanessa is a British journalist, if I'm not mistaken. But Eva Bartlett, <clears throat> that's who we're going to listen to a little bit next. Eva is a Canadian journalist. And what we're going to listen to from Eva is a little bit longer uh, in, in duration. But her, her information that is brought to the table in this particular uh, part of, uh, of this where, where she was presenting the findings to the United Nations, I think is invaluable. Also, her, there was one uh, Norwegian journalist that challenged her findings and her rebuttal is uh, second to none. And I am not a supporter of the United Nations whatsoever, but I do realize that that seems to be the outlet the different findings are always presented, such as in the case right now that there has been a 37-page report uh, presented to the United Nations to justify an attack on the Syrian government and the Syrian people. It's not just the Syrian government, it's the Syrian people, because ultimately they are the ones that will pay the price for this uh, illegal war. Let's listen to what uh, Eva, uh, Eva has to say here, and uh, a Canadian journalist, and very closely, please listen, uh, it's a remarkable young lady. She actually went to North Korea as well. So I encourage you to look her up, look up the information she's sh sharing, as well as Vanessa Bealey. I wish I had Vanessa Bealey on here as well. Um, we've corresponded with Vanessa quite a few times. She's a remarkable journalist herself, has really exposed the white helmets, and so has Eva as well. Listen to this. The representative of my country, Canada, is raising or has raised a resolution which is not about human rights, it's not about uh, the people of Syria. It's a resolution meant to point fingers and to vilify the governments of Syria and Russia. And this resolution relates to a UN Security Council resolution that was vetoed by Russia and China some days ago. That resolution pertained to another useless ceasefire. Let me just uh, remind you, as far as when the delegation went, this was during the time when Aleppo, uh, as the Western media was reporting, was under siege by the Syrian government. All right, this is what, if you remember, the State Department the other day brought out, put a spotlight on Eastern Ghouta. Now they're doing that because they know that there's going to be a chemical attack coming and it's gonna be carried out by the White Helmets, but they want you to think that it's gonna be carried out by Damascus instead. And so, the State Department had us really pay close attention to Aleppo. This is where the White Helmets documentary was created from. Uh, this is the organization she refers to in the State Department address without calling them the White Helmets. Uh, the Last Man in Aleppo is the name of the documentary. It's on Netflix. Take a look at it. It is a propaganda piece. They got a, uh, an Oscar. I always say because they were great actors and they continue to do exactly that. In fact, someone challenged us on our video we posted the other day of the Syrians that were inside the cages, the women and stuff, that was reported. I contacted my own source on the ground that actually uh, had posted the video and was able to confirm 
uh, that no, this was not an old video. These were uh, Alawites that were being held prisoner in there uh, to be used as the target so that the Syrian and Russian government would actually kill them so that they would have body counts. Very troubling indeed. Let's listen. I'm sorry to interrupt uh, Eva. I'll let her continue on without interruption. In Syria, which would have no bearing on, uh, no bring no good to the people of Syria, and which follows um, a week of liberation of areas of Aleppo, which now amounts to about seven or 95 percent of areas of Aleppo that have been occupied for years by terrorist factions. So at this time, when 100,000 civilians in these areas occupied for years by terrorist factions have been liberated, the UN uh, parties in the UN wanted to impose another ceasefire. And I, I want to remind people why these ceasefires are indeed pointless. The last ceasefire in September was, from the very um, start, negated by 20 main terrorist factions who declared they were not going to participate, and from the very beginning violated the ceasefire over 300 times during the duration of the ceasefire. And not only these terrorist factions, while the Syrians and while the Russians um, adhered to the tenets of the ceasefire, but the American-led coalition itself violated the ceasefire by targeting Syrian army positions in Deir ez-Zor, killing at least 83 Syrian soldiers in a prolonged attack that lasted nearly one hour and which enabled ISIS to, over to overtake that position. So this is one reason why a ceasefire is pointless at this point in time. There is no faith that any of the parties that the U.S. and Western leaders who uh, have funded these terrorists, there's no faith that they can actually control the terrorists and get them to adhere to a ceasefire. And the people of Aleppo want Aleppo to be completely freed. And I speak having been to Aleppo four times, and this is the will of people in Aleppo. Um, so on that note, I'd just like to talk about um, briefly, I've been to Syria six times since 2014, two of which were with um, international delegations, and four times were independently on a visa I applied for, paid for, and waited for. Um, my trips have been self-funded or fundraised, and I've gone at my own risk and been able to travel freely in the country to areas I wish to travel to. I've been many times to Homs, to Malula, to Latakia, Tartus, um, Siaf, Sueda, and again Aleppo four times. And I mention these because I think it's important people realize I have, in, wherever I've gone, I've spoken in Arabic to the people I'm speaking with, what uh, Donna, what Sarah have said, the, that the people support their army and government is absolutely true. Whatever you hear in the corporate media is the complete opposite. And on that note, what you hear in the corporate media, and I will name them, BBC, Guardian, New York Times, etc., on Aleppo is also opposite of reality. Aleppo since 2012 has been inhabited by different terrorist factions, among them al-Nusra, among them the so-called Free Syrian Army, which has committed the same heinous acts of terrorism as al-Nusra, as ISIS, as Ahad al-Sham, as Nuruddin Lazinki, which beheaded a 12-year-old Palestinian child, and somehow is still deemed moderate. Um, since 2012, these areas of Aleppo, which have now recently been freed, um, their occupation by these terrorist factions has meant the greater Aleppo, the 1.5 million plus population of greater Aleppo, have suffered sieges, denying them food and medicine. They've suffered for years a want of electricity and water, and they've suffered daily bombardment by these terrorists of mortars, of gas canister bombs, which are improvised and made locally, of water heater bombs, which are even more powerful and can level um, floors of entire buildings, of conventional weapons like grab rockets supplied by the West, and etc. Um, as I said, they've suffered these uh, attacks on a daily basis, and even now, because there are still Western-backed terrorists in pockets of Aleppo, there are still mortars and gas canister bombs raining down, and people are still dying in Aleppo. This is another reason why the liberation and securing of these areas is imperative because that will actually bring peace to Aleppo. Now, um, my colleagues here mentioned uh, the nature of unity in Syria and the fact that Syrians are, see themselves first as Syrian uh, before any sect. This is an important point, because our media and the Gulf media has made Syria out to be sectarian, which is something the Syrians themselves have denied. But it's something, it's a tool to make people confused. It's a tool to make people believe that it's Sunnis against Bashar al-Assad, when in fact, bear in mind that Aleppo is overwhelmingly Sunni and is with the government and is with the army and is suffering from the terrorists who declare that they are liberating the city in Syria. Um, other points about Aleppo are um, hospitals in Aleppo have been attacked. I'm sure you've heard in the media that hospitals have been, have been attacked. Very important. Well, this media is referring to the pockets of Aleppo that were occupied by terrorists. 
and they have manufactured stories, and I can give you a precise account. In April of this year, there was a hospital called the El Quds Hospital, which in a concerted effort, all media said, was attacked and targeted and badly damaged by either the Syrians or the Russians. In fact, the Russians had satellite imagery showing that this hospital was in the same shape that it was in in October 2015. No difference. Therefore, it was not attacked. Months later, The Guardian, which is a prominent British newspaper, newspaper actually said the Al-Quds hospital that it had alleged months prior to be attacked and destroyed was treating victims of so-called chemical weapons attacks. So even the media that is lying is inconsistent in their lies. But there have been hospitals attacked. Uh, I went to the al David hospital, which is in Aleppo city. It's a maternity hospital. It was attacked on May 3rd, and three women were killed. You would think this would be something raised at the UN or by so-called human rights groups, but it was not. Uh, in December 2013, the Kindi hospital was attacked and destroyed. It was the largest and best cancer treatment hospital in the Middle East. It was destroyed by Al-Nusra terrorist truck bombings. And in fact, in recent media reports on Aleppo, again alleging Syrian or Russian strikes on hospital, hospitals, Fox News actually had the audacity to use a photo of Al-Kindi Hospital and allege that this is in eastern areas of Aleppo that, and that this hospital had been attacked by Syrian or Russian strikes. This goes to show how much the media has been lying from the very beginning about Syria and continues to lie. Um, when I went to Aleppo, I spoke with the Aleppo Medical Association. They comprise 4,160 active and registered doctors. More lies in the media have said the last doctor in Aleppo, the last pediatrician in Aleppo. Of these over 4,000 doctors, 800 of them are specialists. Um, so you can see that when the media talks about Aleppo, it's talking about areas that were occupied by terrorists and it's completely negating the suffering and the will of the Syrian people in greater Aleppo. That's just to give you a little brief point of what uh, uh, Vanessa, excuse me, Eva Bartlett had to say there. Now, I want to skip real quick, and I'm going to try to hurry up not to be too much longer with you guys, but uh, some very important things that need to be brought out. Uh, and of course, this is all about Aleppo. I will be bringing more information out here uh, in the coming days about East Gouda as well. But let's move forward. This is where there is given an opportunity uh, for the journalists to ask a question. And this one journalist in particular, I find it very interesting. He challenges uh, Eva Bartlett, and her response is epic. Much, uh, uh, I'm Christopher Rottenberg with the Norwegian newspaper Aften Boston. Uh, a question for, um, or two questions for Ms. Bartlett here. Um, as a journalist, I, I'm sure you can appreciate uh, getting other uh, impressions than empirical impressions from the ground. When you talk about the Syrian people and what the Syrian people want, how can you quantify that? Uh, do you have any independent uh, uh, surveys uh, where, where you can actually uh, document that? And, and secondly, um, you talk about the corporate media, the Western media, the lies, uh, and all of this. Uh, could you explain what you think might be the agenda from us in the uh, Western media, and why we should lie, why the uh, international organizations on the ground should lie, why we shouldn't believe all these uh, ac absolutely uh, documentable uh, facts that we see from the ground, these hospitals being bombed these civilians who are talking about the atrocities that they have been experiencing. Um, how can you justify calling all of us liars? Sure. Thank um, you. I mean, there are certainly honest journalists amongst the very um, compromised establishment media. Let's start with your second question. So, international organizations on the ground. Tell me which ones are on the ground in Eastern Aleppo. Yeah, okay, I'll tell you, there are none. There are none. These organizations are relying on the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is based in Coventry, UK, and which is one man. They're relying on compromised groups like um, the White Helmets, which let's let's talk about the White Helmets. The White Helmets were funded were founded in 2013 by a British ex-military officer. They have been fa uh, funded to the tune of 100 million dollars by the US, UK, and Europe and other states. They purport to be rescuing civilians in eastern Aleppo and Idlib, yet no one in eastern Aleppo has heard of them. And I say no one, bearing in mind that now 95% of these areas of eastern Aleppo are liberated. The White Helmets purport to be neutral, yet they can be found um, carrying guns and standing on the dead bodies of Syrian soldiers. 
and uh, their video footage actually contains uh, children that have been recycled in different reports. So you can find a girl named Aya who turns up in a report in month, say, August, and she turns up in the next month in two different locations. So they are not credible. The SOHR is not credible. Unnamed activists are not credible. Once or twice, maybe, but every time, not credible. So your sources on the ground, you don't have them. Um, as for your agenda, not your, but the agenda of some corporate media, it is the agenda of regime change. How can the New York Times, I was reading it this morning, or how can Democracy Now!, which I was reading the other day, maintain until this day that this is a civil war in Syria? How can they maintain until this day that, there were un that the protests were unarmed and nonviolent until, say, 2012? That is absolutely not true. How can they maintain that the Syrian government is attacking civilians in Aleppo when every person that's coming out of these areas occupied by terrorists is saying the opposite? So that's with, it, um, your with regards to your question on lying Western media. How do I quantify the support of the Syrian people? The elections. In 2014, the Syrian people held elections. The voter turnout was 88%, including people in Lebanon where I was during the, the elections in Lebanon, which were actually ran for two days, extended hours, people walking for kilometers to reach the embassy, including people who flew from their own countries like mine, which has criminally shut the Syrian embassy so that Syrian people have no rights, and including people within Syria who braved a torrent of terrorist mortars and, and missiles on election day. And yet, voter uh, turnout rate was something like 80, uh, 88%, I believe. That's just to give you a little insight from Eva Bartlett. And just to me, it's amazing some of the information. And as she also pointed out, uh, the Civil War actually did not begin with peaceful protest. It was armed protest. And that's something that I've not covered before. Uh, but we do need to go back maybe and visit that issue as well. I want to take, though, real quick, we're gonna, this is Alfred Martyr, uh, who is the president of the U.S. Peace Council. We're going to only take just a, about 30 seconds or so, uh, 45 seconds with Alfred here. Real quick, backing up here to 5 minutes, 30 seconds on this video here. Just get a quick comment from him as one of the delegation. And then also, again, with Henry Lohendorf. Uh, and then we'll move on and kind of wrap up this video. People have been intense. And it is our purpose to try to bring some light, some understanding, which can perhaps lead to the American people demanding an end to the intervention and peace in, in, in Syria. We reached out to many organizations, peace organizations in our country to try to get a broad delegation to go. I would be less than honest if I did not say that some did not come because they were fearful of going into a war zone. Others demonstrated the confusion that does exist because of reading the, the propaganda and the barrage of, unfortunately, the media, which gives such a one-sided story. We feel we have that obligation. That's just to give you a little glimpse there of Alfred there. And, of course, I'm going to jump real quick over here um, to... Um, Dr. Henry Lowendorf, once again, I want to play just two minutes of his comments here, just as a reminder from the other day, because you never know when someone's going to be listening to this video here and they have not heard uh, the full story. Judy Bellow, who lives in Rochester, and Vanessa Bealey, who is a, an independent journalist who has returned to Syria to report directly uh, what she is seeing as, as uh, she investigates further um, the truth of what's happening in Syria. I think what Alfred said is so true. We are fighting a mass of propaganda that has demonized the Syrian government, demonized its leaders, 
a, an effort that precedes every other intervention that the United States has made over the course of many, many decades in order to convince people that it's okay for quote-unquote humanitarian reasons to overthrow a government and to replace it with whatever. The United States prefers uh, a government that is not independent, that is a willing uh, participant in what the US, whatever US policy is. So what we saw in, in Damascus and what we saw in the two villages we visited outside Damascus belies the propaganda that has um, overwhelmed us. It's hard, it, it, it's hard for even those of us who have been in the peace movement for a long time. It's hard for us to ignore this propaganda. It is so uh, well orchestrated. I think that says it very clearly. One last delegate that was on that particular uh, trip there was uh, Joe Jameson. Um, and uh, I think some of his comments here are certainly uh, paramount uh, in what he says. So I want to play just a few minutes, a couple of minutes of, of his comments there, and we'll move on to the closing uh, arguments that I want to share with you about uh, this whole situation that appears to really following into the footsteps of uh, the near-death experience of that young man, uh, Nathan, out of Israel. Listen to I this. I associate myself with all the comments of my colleagues here, but I'm reminded uh, of the famous comment by the American writer Mark Twain, who once said that uh, it's not what we don't know that gets us into trouble. What gets us into trouble is what we think we know for sure that just ain't so. That's right. And that's what I think of when I think about my fellow Americans and what they know about Syria and what they think they know about the war and the Syrian government and the Syrian leadership. Uh, what they think they know, I'll argue, just ain't so. And so we have to take that on because we're getting into trouble. Uh, our delegation came to Syria with political views and assumptions, uh, but we were determined to be skeptics. Isn't that interesting? To everything. To came we with could. political to views. confirm or disconfirm received opinion and establish and conventional wisdom and to follow the facts wherever they led us. Uh, I concluded a number of things from the trip. I won't go over things that my colleagues have already mentioned. Uh, the motive, in my opinion, of the U.S. war is to destroy an independent Arab secular state. It wants, it's the last secular Arab state standing, and it wants a client regime, like Libya, like Iraq, like a number of other countries you could mention. The U.S. hostility to independent Syria long pre uh, precedes 2011, the beginning of the war. The U.S. I concluded, claims to be against ISIS terrorism, but yet has it's been loath to fight a really consistent fight against terrorism. Certain privileged groups, such as the Al Nusra Front, uh, the names shift, are called moderate rebels because they fight the Syrian government, and the U.S. wants that. They are not moderate. They beheaded a 12-year-old boy when we were there. We saw it on, on uh, YouTube and on uh, TV. The motives of the U.S. proxy war uh, states are somewhat different. Sectarian motives and regional power rivalries affect uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, the Wahhabist ideology, the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, is a sick, medieval, backward ideology. It drives a Saudi Arabia. State. It motivates that state <clears throat> to finance this war, and. Damascus, by contrast, promotes a socially inclusive and pluralistic form of Islam. And we met the leaders of that form of Islam, and they are humane and democratic-minded people and have every reason to join with the American people in stopping this insane support for Wahhabism, which is behind so much terrorism in the world including 9-11. Um, those of, of my fellow countrymen who are dogmatic about Assad demonization are not going to like what I have to say now, which is that the Syrian government is popular, 
And for that reason, it is winning the war. Uh, the and we know that a lot of that has changed since then, uh, now that there is this new front to try to take down the Syrian government. Uh, and it's very troubling indeed. And as I close out on this, I wanted to bring you to a yet another incredible evidence from Seymour Hersh, uh, a renowned journalist, a British journalist, and what he had to say. It's called The Red Line and the Rat Line. Seymour M. Hersh on Obama, Erdogan, and the Syrian rebels. I'm going to read a lot of this article, so it's taken me about two minutes to do it, and we're going to wrap up. In 2011, Barack Obama led an allied military intervention in Libya without consulting the U.S. Congress. Last August, after the sarin attack on Damascus suburb of Ghouta, he was ready to launch an allied airstrike, and this time to punish the Syrian government for allegedly crossing the red line. He had set in 2012 on the use of the chemical weapons. Then with less than two days to go before the plan strike, he announced that he would seek congressional approval for the intervention. The strike was postponed as Congress prepared for hearings and subsequently canceled when Obama accepted Assad's offer to relinquish his chemical arsenal in a deal brokered by Russia. Why did Obama delay and then relent on Syria when he was not shy about rushing into Libya? The answer lies in a clash between those in the administration who were committed to enforcing the red line and military leaders who thought that going to war was both unjustified and potentially disastrous. I'm afraid, friends, that there may be some new military leaders. Remember two of the generals that stopped a nuclear war, well, one of them, or at least this one lady that we know of from the Air Force is in prison, military prison, for not being willing to push a nuclear button against Russia. Obama's change of mind had its origins at uh, Porton Down, the defense laboratory in w uh, Wiltshire. British intelligence had obtained a sample of the sarin used in the 21st August attack and analysis demonstrated that the gas used didn't match the batches known to exist in the Syrian army's chemical arsenal. Well, I guess Aaron Erdem was right, wasn't he? But you know what? In the lamestream media, you keep hearing the same old, same old. They gassed their people in 2013, and they do it again, we're going to take them down. I guess those ones that called for war have made it to the top. All right, so it goes on to say, exit in the Syrian army's chemical weapons arsenal. The message that w the case against Syria wouldn't hold up was quickly relayed to the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. The British report heightened doubts inside the Pentagon. The Joint Chiefs were already preparing to warn Obama that its plan for a far-reaching bomb and missile attack on Syria's infrastructure could lead to a wider war in the Middle East. In consequence, the American officers delivered a last-minute caution to the president, which, in their view, eventually led to his canceling the attack. But don't forget, there's still, as General Wesley Clark had pointed out, they wanted to take down Syria. So there were those that were still calling for the bringing down of Syria. For months, there had been an acute concern among the senior military leaders and the intelligence community about the role of the war in Syria's neighbors, especially Turkey. Prime Minister Recep Erdogan was known to be supporting the al-Nusra front a jihadist faction among the rebel opposition as well as also other Islamic, uh, uh, Islamist re uh, groups, rebel groups. We knew there were some in the Turkish government, a former senior U.S. intelligence official who has accused uh, access to current intelligence, told me, who believed that they could get Assad's nuts and advice uh, nuts and advice by dabbling with a sarin attack inside of Syria and forcing Obama to make good on his red line threat. Joint Chiefs also knew that Obama's administration public's claims that only the Syrian army had access to sarin were wrong. The American and British intelligence community had been aware since the spring of 2013 that some rebel units in Syria were developing chemical weapons. Yeah, they had the plant. They'd already taken over the area. On June 20th, uh, uh, analysis for the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency issued a highly classified five-page talking points briefing for the DIA Deputy Director David Shedd, which stated that al-Nusra maintained a sarin production sale. Its program, the paper said, was the most advanced sarin plot since al-Qaeda's pre-9-11 effort. Right? Intelligence has long known that al-Qaeda experimented with chemical weapons and has a video of its gas experiments with dogs. 
The DIA paper went on. Previous IC focus had been all, uh, almost entirely on Syrian uh, chemical weapons stock, stockpiles. Now we see an ANF attempting to make its own chemical weapons. Al Nusra Front's relative freedom of operation within Syria leads us to, uh, to assess the group's chemical weapons aspirations would be difficult to disrupt in the future. The paper drew on classified intelligence from numerous agencies, Turkey and Saudi-based chemical facilities, and said were attempting to obtain sarin uh, precursors in bulk, tens of kilograms likely for the anticipated large-scale production of effort in Syria. Makes you wonder then, maybe some of that chemical weapons from North Korea are not going to the Syrian government, but going to these terrorist organizations that have been backed by Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and even Western partners. Uh, I, you can read this article, I'll post it in here for you. I don't want to go into the entire article with you, but it kind of gives you just a little bit of an idea of just where the chemical weapons do come from. Very troubling indeed, the information that's coming out, friends. It's not the Syrian government, but they're determined to take them down one way or the other. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Erev Tov in a world of Ain Shalom.